First of all, we have Larry Ainsworth, who is the author or co-author of 15 published books, including most recently Common Format of Assessments 2.0, published by Colin. Drawing upon 24 years of experience as an upper elementary and middle school classroom teacher in demographically diverse schools, throughout Larry's career as a professional developer, he has delivered keynote addresses and breakout sessions across the U.S. and beyond, and he has regularly worked on-site in school systems to assist leaders and educators in understanding and implementing powerful standards-based practices. Our second presenter today will be Mary Jane O'Connell, who is the co-author, along with Kara Vandis, who unfortunately couldn't join us today, so uh, Mary Jane is going to carry the torch for the both of them. Um, they're co-authors of the book Partnering with Students, also published by Colin. Mary Jane brings a unique practitioner's perspective to her work with educators. She has seven years of classroom teaching experience and over 20 years of experience as a building principal in year-round schools ranging in size from 450 to 980 students. Since 2007, she has served as a consultant working with teachers at all levels, with building administrators, and with central office staff in a variety of urban, suburban, and rural settings. So with that, I will turn it over to Larry to start his section of the presentation. Well, good afternoon and evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our webinar. The theme of this, as you see, is really about bringing clarity to student learning outcomes. And because Mary Jane and I are both going to be sharing uh, two presentation workshop overviews with you, we will only be able to um, briefly show you and highlight the key aspects of this new work that we're very excited about at Core One because we've heard so often that we really do have a, a lack or, a, or, a, or what we could say a um, problem with the fact that clarity is something that everybody agrees that we need. But unfortunately, we have no way for many people to identify the fact of how they're going to achieve that clarity. We're just not crystal clear about what we want our students to know and be able to do. So by beginning with clarity of learning goals, We'll have a sharp focus for both instruction, assessment, and this will be absolutely essential for teachers achieving the maximum, maximum possible impact on student learning. So I'm going to start a little bit with the research, and obviously since we're all solution-oriented, I wanted to give you a little bit of the research first that grounds this work, and then give you a quick preview of the practical steps with examples that all teachers pre-K to 12 can use to determine learning intentions and success criteria for their students. You're probably familiar with Dr. Hattie's work um, with regard to the effect size of 0, 0.40. He refers to it as a hinge point. It equates to about, about a year of student growth for each year of teacher input. So obviously what we want to do is look at those practices that have shown through his global research about which practices truly can make a significant difference. Now here's his barometer of influence and again you can see the zone of desired effects is any practice that can show a 0 0.40 impact or effect you know above and beyond the course of one school year. So it's interesting to note that teacher clarity from the research has posted an effect size of 0 0.75. So, I mean, obviously we can all do the math, but that's nearly two years of student growth for one year of input. And a couple of things I wanted to point out with this is that I'm at, we're actually taking the position that clarity is arguably the most important effect of all. And the reason for that is because it makes all the other effects possible. And I'll give you an example of, or two of what I mean by that. So think about the idea of response to intervention, for example. RTI is a top five effect size, according to Dr. Hattie's research. And we all understand that clarity of learning intent essential, I'm sorry, clarity of learning intentions is essential to help the students develop a plan to close their learning gaps. So again, clarity, absolutely critical. The next one we could look at would, might be, for example, classroom discussion, which is also a top 10 effect. Purposeful classroom discussions absolutely depend on students and teachers being clear about the learning focus. And then just one more I want to point out, since so many of us are working diligently to improve the quality of feedback that teachers give students, that students give to teachers, and that students give one another, 
Uh, meaningful feedback is also a top 10 in the effect sizes, which can also nearly double the speed of learning. But what's the caveat? If and when that feedback is directly related to clear learning outcomes. So this is the reason why we're making a new focus, um, very high priority focus on achieving clarity before we begin designing instruction, assessment, and so on. And it's interesting, there's a wonderful book from Michael Absalom, who's from New Zealand, and you can see the quote on screen. I'll give you a moment to read that. And I think it's the idea that when teachers, are, have, when teachers and students have that clarity, teachers can design intentionally assessments, they can plan instruction, they can select appropriate curriculum materials, directly aligned to those learning intentions. And this whole idea about learning intentions, which I'm going to be defining now, um, is about providing that clarity for both teaching and learning. You probably heard the phrases that are associated, or the questions, the taglines, so to speak, that are associated with learning intentions. This represents the where are we going. And using a travel metaphor, learning intentions identify the destination of the trip. And in general terms, they actually describe what is to be learned in a lesson or in a unit of study. So keeping with that travel metaphor, we'll move on to the next one of success criteria. Often these two are used interchangeably, but they are actually distinct from one another and yet mutually interdependent. Success criteria represent the how are we going. They provide students in particular with the clarity and the idea is that these are specific descriptors of how students will achieve the learning intentions. And when teachers and students have these success criteria clearly laid out at the inception of a unit or lesson, they do provide that roadmap to the destination that focuses instruction. And also it helps really motivate kids to engage in their own learning. Now, one real exciting addition that I've put into this work is the relevancy piece, the reason for the trip. And the idea is we want to be, I believe, more explicit for the student and the teacher, the reasons why they should be engaging in this pursuit of the destination of the learning intention. So we've added this piece on relevancy or the reason or the rationale for making the trip. The last component of this highly important uh, component is what we're calling learning progressions. Learning progressions are the where to next. And you know, it's, it's probably true that a lot of American educators, anyway, have not had a great deal of experience with the progressions of learning from this to this to this to this in order to achieve the overall learning intention. So we're referring to these often as instructional scaffolds that students need to achieve that learning intention. And I want to think of these as building blocks um, of what students need next in their learning in order to achieve that learning intention. Some like to think of it as prerequisite skills and concepts that lay out the sequence path of learning. Path of learning. But the, here again, with our theme of clarity, the progressions really provide that clarity of where to next so that we can see exactly the trajectory of learning. Now, again, here's another quote by my, my esteemed colleagues, Mary Jane and Kara. I want to give you a moment to read this, because I think it's absolutely critical about how it must begin with the teacher. So with that in mind, again, briefly just to set that stage, provide a context, give you some research in support of this work, I'd like to give you a quick preview of the, the steps that I've put together to help teachers in all grades, all content areas, you know, take a standard and then develop it, develop the learning intention, the success criteria, the learning progressions that go with it. So, here is a quick overview, and I've broken them into a couple steps. The first two, um, I should say, appear together. And I want to emphasize the fact that I'm going to give you this quick little overview. When we teach this in our workshop setting, which is a one-day workshop, I like to keep it as simple as possible just so people can really get their heads around the, the process. 
So we ask people to select one standard, not a whole set of standards for a unit yet. That comes later. But we start by identifying one standard as an instructional focus that would be part of a unit of study. And then we want to give them examples and have them an op give them an opportunity to restate that standard in student-friendly wording. And this is what we're referring to as the learning intention. And again, I'm going to show you um, an example of that in just a moment. But for now, think about it as that relationship between communicating the actual verbatim wording of the standard in kid-friendly language to the student. Then the other piece, again, going back to what I presented a few minutes ago about Michael Absalom's emphasis on including the reason for the trip, the why, I, we built in, along with each learning intention, why it's important for students to learn it and why it's important for teachers, from their point of view, to ensure that their students learn it. So this will be our step three. Our step four is all about the success criteria. Now, these are the details of what the students will do to achieve the learning intention. And again, we call these the success criteria or the how. So as you see, just in these first four steps, you take a standard, you translate it into student wording, you decide why it's important for students to learn and for teachers to teach, and then you write those details of what the students will do to achieve it so they really have that understanding that if I do this, then that's going to give me the success relative to that learning intention. Now, once we've got that foundation set, so to speak, we're now going to look at that learning intention, and we're going to break it into learning progressions. And simply what we mean by that is we're just going to identify those skills and concepts, those prerequisites, that lead up to the learning intention. And again, I'll show you when we get to that step in a, in a few minutes with a little bit more explanation. And then I'll show you how what we then do is just select one of those learning progressions and write the specific success criteria for that learning progression. And this will be clear when you see how these, this is really at the lesson level. When a teacher is teaching a particular lesson over one course, I mean, I'm sorry, over the course of one class period or even two or three, um, we want to identify what the kids are going to learn and then also provide them with the clarity of what that they need to demonstrate in their work as evidence that they've met that particular learning progression. So again, notice again, we're talking about student-friendly wording. So that first step is really all about taking that learning intention of the standard, I should say, and then rewording it into kids speak with age-appropriate language. And then, but here's the key that's really important. We can't lose anything from the standard in translation. We have to be sure we're retaining the rigor and the intent of that original standard. So I'll give you a couple examples. I wanted to make this a little bit interactive here. Um, if you look at this speaking and listening standard from a grade six, you understand it's got all the details in it. And I want to show you what two possible translations would be, and then see what you think of which one would be the learning intention. So here's the first one. Now, remember, you're looking for the paraphrase, how to give an effective presentation to confidently and accurately share your ideas on a topic. Or you can look at this one with more detail. Now, if you can look at those two, which one do you think is the learning intention? Now, again, wait time is up. Hopefully, you selected the first one. Now, you think, well, I selected the second. What's wrong with that? The problem is that the, there is too much information in the second one. It's got actually a lot of the success criteria. We're looking for that general statement in student-friendly language. So here's another one. Try this one. This is a fifth grade uh, literature standard. And now we have this opportunity to, to decide whether you think this might be the learning intention or whether you think this would be the learning intention. Now, the key on this one is you want to keep it on the, a focus on the learning. We don't want to bring in the context yet of what the teachers are going to use for students to learn and demonstrate their understanding of that, that learning intention. So the idea is the second one is really more representative of what a true learning intention is. It does not include the means that students will use to achieve it. 
We have several work examples in the workbook that we've put together, math, reading, science. We're adding new ones as we go along. I thought I would just pull out one example of a science one to just illustrate the steps with a, with a quick um, example. So if you'll notice, this is a um, next generation science standard for middle school. And again, this works in all content areas, all grade levels, but I just decided to pick something halfway in between. So you'll notice that we're, if you look at this now, the, the standard is stated in step one, but then the translation of that, it's not, a, it's not a very big leap on this one, but I still think this one communicates more effectively what this is about. Describe how the cell functions using a model. A little bit less detail. Now, I want you to read, if you will, this piece on a shared agreement and about why it's important before I show you an example of step three. And you know, it's been very interesting because many teachers and leaders that have been to the workshop have commented on the incredible importance of this step to really provide students and themselves with the rationale for why it's important to decide that this should indeed be taught and learned. So if you look at this one, now this is a little more lengthy, so don't let that, you know, scare you off there, but we, I broke this into why that learning intention is important, first for students. So if you, you can see the content there. Now this is actually the bigger picture. Some people see this as the big idea of the enduring understanding, which you're probably quite familiar with. But again, I think it's important to identify this explicit reason for teaching students and having students learn this. Now what about the teacher's role? The teacher's role would probably be a little broader and larger. So during the workshop, the teachers are actually thinking about working collaboratively or individually about why is it important for my students to learn this from their point of view and from mine. So another quote now as we move into the success criteria, John Hattie has probably popularized these two, this term or both of these terms, learning intentions and success criteria more than anyone else. So I'll give you a moment to read this. And notice that idea, but it's the way of knowing that the intention has been achieved. And that's why it's so critical to state as exactly as possible what it is that the students need to know and be able to demonstrate. And that, again, goes back to our focus on clarity. So I thought I would, again, give you a little chance to decide which one you thought the success criteria might be. Now, the learning intention you saw earlier, you will describe how to use how the cell functions using a model, which one do you think is, shows a list of those success criteria? Now, you could probably defend either one. The reason why the second one is the more appropriate success criteria list, even though it's fairly brief, is because the first one in the first option, talks about using materials provided. Decide. You can't measure decide. Labeling each cell part is not a very high level skill. Writing description is important, but not necessarily what that intention or that standard is going for. So we feel like the, the second option gives more clarity and purpose and also broadens what's expected of students. So here's an example of that same one. In step four, we're going to write the details. Now you notice here there's only a couple. It's the same as what you saw a minute ago. There's only a couple uh, success criteria. Different um, progressions will have more success criteria, and others one will others will have fewer. But this is the more general one for the unit of study, in particular for this standard. So again, now we're going to move into our fifth step, which is really important and may be new for a lot of listeners and a lot of American educators, this, this idea of learning progressions. So read what Jim Popham has to say about this. Now you'll notice he uses the term subskills and bodies of enabling knowledge. If that seems a little bit too complicated, just think of it as skills and concepts. 
you know, written, and that's the way you're, you're going to see these um, learning progressions written. They emphasize a skill that the student has to do along with a concept that a student needs to demonstrate. Now, I took the liberty of quoting myself, forgive me, but the reason I put that in there was because I like the phrase in increments of instruction and the fact that these increments of instruction are then sequenced by the teacher so that they will occur in the order that would, would naturally allow students to build their understanding from simple to complex. So when you look at this one now, you'll notice that we, oh, I want to back up just for a moment um, to say that, that when you look at this learning intention and your job is then to brainstorm the different components that would enable students to achieve it, these will be a combination of lower level skills and higher level skills. But the idea of what you see represented here is the teacher decided, and actually Kara Vandes provided this example, you'll notice how it begins with explain itself to the basic unit of life and identifying parts of the cell. This is pretty straightforward entry level you know, demonstration on the part of students. But look what happens as you start moving into three, and then four, and then five. By the time the student is, is at the fifth learning progression, they're actually achieving the purpose of that learning intention. And the reason why I've highlighted the fourth one, construct an accurate model, is because I'll show you in the last step how that one has its own success criteria. But everybody, you know what is so wonderful about this is that these Learning progressions really do indeed lay out the pathway for learning, and teachers working individually or collaboratively get very excited about this because they realize now that what they've been doing, maybe not as intentionally, is laying out that pathway of instruction toward students attaining a particular learning intention. They're really thinking out their teaching map of what they're going to teach, first, second, third, fourth, fifth. And think about the clarity that's going to give them that will enable them then to select their instructional materials and resources. It just provides that clear pathway of learning that we're looking for. It's also interesting to note that, that the idea that these learning progressions, they, they should be providing the focus for lesson-specific formative assessments. And again, I'll show you that as we get into our last piece. Now, one of the exciting uh, parts of this step is that we provide educators at the workshops with planning tools, different ways that they can identify those learning progressions so they're not just left on their own like, we'll figure it out. We give them some wonderful tools that will help them identify those learning progressions. And then when they get to that final step, they're now going to write the success criteria for the, for the learning progressions. And we call this the how are we doing step. In other words, if I have a, a progression I'm looking at, at, at demonstrating my understanding of in this lesson today or this lesson that may span a couple of days, I again need to know exactly what it is the teacher wants me to demonstrate or show in my work that I've achieved it. And I want to obviously, as a student, know it for myself. So the one I had highlighted a moment ago, which was this number four, construct an accurate model, I wanted to just show you with one of these how we might provide the details for students to actually create the success criteria specific to that learning progression. So here they are. Now this really provides some very clear guidelines for students. And then this way that students know I've done the first identify the type of cell, okay, I've decided my materials, I'm going to construct my part of the cell, I'm going to labor it, and then the rigor comes in where they have to develop a written description for the function of each part of the cell. And everybody remember, this is only one standard in a unit of study. There would be other standards, obviously, that are taught in this unit. But again, to illustrate this process, when we're first learning, I just wanted to keep it simple and have people learn that process by working with one uh, standard as they go through it. And again, you'll see the notation again that a learning progression may indeed require more than one lesson to complete. But again, we've moved from the general to the specific, and this how are we doing step is going to really enable students to give spoken and written responses um, to demonstrate 
that their learning is, is, is truly, has truly taken place, it's going to make their learning visible. It'll also help students and teachers know where they need to go next in their learning. But one other piece to um, emphasize is to show the connections. So we've got the learning progressions, we've got the success criteria, well then obviously the teachers are going to need to develop some assessments for learning, some quick progress checks that are matched to those learning progressions so that teachers and students can see how they're doing, where they need to go next. And again, this is why it's, this is such a nice entry level for the common form of assessments. 2.0 workshop that Colin offers because it, it really establishes absolute clarity of learning intentions with the success criteria and then the teachers want to know how to write effective assessments to measure it. And then lastly, the, the whole point of feedback as we all know is to make visible what kids currently know and what they need next to close their learning gaps. And what's really great about this is that students can see how well they're proceeding in their understanding of the targeted learning intentions, learning progressions, and where they need to go next. And then teachers can use that same information diagnostically to adjust instruction in order to help the kids close their identified learning gaps. So really it's a very reciprocal process that's going to benefit tremendously students and teachers and hopefully when well implemented over time, we'll also let that dramatic research of a two-year gain of student learning in one year become quite feasible. And again, all the result of teacher clarity. So last, just wrapping up, I just wanted to let you know this is the cover of the new workbook. We're really excited. This just came out. And um, in the first day, as we said, we provide all the examples and the templates and people learn the process. And then those that are interested can come back for a second day, either to continue working on that process uh, with uh, a consultant facilitating, or they might even be ready then to move right into the day two workshop, which is to look at this multiple standards for a unit of study and then apply that very same process to several students so they've got that clarity needed to go ahead and begin a unit planning. So there's more information as you see at the bottom on those two uh, website links. And I know that was very fast. I hope you've got some calls and uh, questions you might have submitted. So I'm going to pause for a moment and see if Jeff's going to or uh, Lisa will give me any questions that have been submitted. And then I want to just say to all of you that if there isn't time to address all questions, our emails are at the end. And please don't hesitate to send me an email. I'll be more than happy to respond. Yes, hi Larry, it's Jeff. As of now, I don't have any questions. If anybody has any questions for Larry, please uh, feel free to type them in to the um, to the chat function. But as of now, Larry, I don't have any questions. Okay, that's great. Well, then Mary Jane is going to take it over, and you're going to be excited to have it now involve students in this process. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, just a little feedback. Hopefully, everyone can hear me, Jeff. We're good? Yeah, it looks great. Okay, thank you. Well, I've had the privilege to work with Larry since 2007, and I can tell you that his work has had great impact in my uh, experience helping schools and school districts navigate this idea of common form of assessments, but getting clear on what students need to learn. But the clarity problem uh, extends beyond just teachers needing to be clear, crystal clear on what must be learned and what are the elements of success. Students need to know this. And when they don't, sometimes we see them being very frustrated or disengaged from learning. But co-constructing success criteria can provide that pathway. And right now, there we go that clarity for students. And I believe it's the missing piece to appropriately challenge students, get them invested in learning, and able to achieve at very high levels so they really own responsibility for their learning. And so today, uh, for this part of the webinar, to help our students grow and invest in their own learning, uh, we'd, like to, we'd like to offer these following learning intentions for our remaining time together. And we'll be talking about how Co-constructing can increase student clarity so students are more invested in their learning. They set their own goals. They're able to self-assess. They're able to provide feedback to themselves and to others. 
and ultimately they can prove and really own their own learning. And students that are able to do that, they have the um, engaging and success co-constructing success criteria. They have the initial elements to be what John Hattie described as an assessment capable learner. And this is one of those top ten. This is number one in that top ten of effects and impact. An assessment capable learner. And according to his research that an effect size of point of 1.44 is more than tripling the rate of learning in one academic year. And the students that have this type of clarity, the effect is almost off the barometer here. But they're able to answer essentially three questions that are really important that many of you have probably heard and already addressed these too, would be this idea of where am I going? So they have clarity on the learning outcomes. How am I going? They're clear not only how they're progressing, but the actions that they are taking that's helping them to progress. And able to answer to, what's next? Where do I go next? The success criteria points that pathway. Uh, in our work, Kara and I also found that there was another piece that's really important, and we formulated in a question, which is, what is my contribution? And this relates to the whole relationship piece of building collaborative relationships for learning in the classroom. Classroom cohesion has a, an effect size of 0.53. Student-teacher relationships can double the rate of learning or very close to that. But when we have collaborative learning relationships in a classroom, effective feedback can be given. And that's the beauty of this idea of success criteria. It provides that specificity and that accuracy and a way that it can be delivered timely so that feedback moves learning forward. There's some new research just out, and this is pretty exciting on success criteria. And Hattie and Donahue published this just in August, their research on learning strategies. And I'll let you take a look at this uh, quote from the research. And what's critical here is that Students have the information before undertaking a task, and therefore that they can be more goal-directed. The other part of that that they point out is students that can articulate the success criteria and they're taught, explicitly taught, the criteria. They're more likely to, you can read this for yourself, be strategic, be thrilled by success, and they're more likely to reinvest in even attaining more success criteria, challenging themselves. The success criteria, though, really has to be clear and specific. And it's at all levels, it's at surface to deep to transfer levels of learning that enables the students and teacher to monitor their understanding and make adjustments. What's also interesting in this latest research is a meta-analysis of knowing the success criteria. This is brand new. It has an effect size of 1.13, which again is almost able to triple the rate of learning. And what you see here are just a few sampling of the learning strategies that students use and to reference and deepen their understanding of the success criteria. So this new research showed an effect size of 0.76, coming close to doubling the rate of learning. When students use success criteria to plan and predict, plan their learning, plan their progress, how are they going, they're able, when they set personal goals around using success criteria, you see the effect size. When they use an organizer, such as concept mapping, to bring greater clarity to the success criteria. And finally, setting standards for self-judgment, which is self-appraisal, making those uh, assessment decisions for themselves using success criteria. So some pretty powerful impacts coming out about success criteria. Uh, uh, this 
quote from Shirley Clark, who uh, is a lecturer and a researcher, has been at the Institute of Education in London. And she believes from all of her work in the whole formative assessment uh, movement that to empower children is really important and that it's the co-construction process that gives meaning and great impact for students. So essentially what we're trying to do here with our students in co-constructing success criteria is build that, that growth mindset that provides the tools to address those challenges and manage frustrations so students who once thought it was impossible now believe it's possible. And students who didn't think they were able are now able. So I'd like to pause right now and we're going to do a little poll based on what you've heard about this research and Shirley Clark, about what do you think? Why teach success criteria? And you all are going to select one phrase that resonates most with you about why you think we should teach this. So select just one of these phrases, and we'll see the results coming up in just a moment. And we'll keep the poll open for about another minute, so please read through and answer the questions, and we'll close the poll in, a, in about a minute. There's still a few of you. Uh, if you would like to take the poll, it's still open. There's a handful of people that are it's still available. It's still in progress. I'm going to close the poll in about 10 seconds. All righty, now I'm going to close the poll. Last chance to vote on the poll and here we go we should be seeing the results coming up here soon there we go so 30 Two percent, thirty-five percent. Last two. And thank you for that. And you see those here, and really they're all important aspects that contribute to that one point. Um, what was it? One point one three effect size. And probably what you selected is from your own personal experience and what you believe might help your students in your situation most. But they're all a big piece of co-constructing success criteria. And I thank you for, uh, for participating in this poll. So what I'd like to present now is the pathway to co-constructing. And this uh, is part of the information I'm sharing with you today is what we do in our workshop. It's a one-day workshop. can also span to a two-day workshop in which we provide really an experiential piece where teachers co-construct success criteria to feel, see what it feels like from a student's perspective. And then we also um, provide time for teachers to work on their own. So these are, in essence, really basically the steps. The first one is, again, to revisit the learning intentions and success criteria that Larry spoke about, how important it is for teachers to have clarity first before they co-construct success criteria with students. They have to plan a process, and there are multiple methods, and we talk about that in our workshops, about how to plan and how to engage students in the co-construction process using either modeling or using exemplars or products to help them understand it. Then the actual engagement and generating it with students. 
And that usually involves a lot of brainstorming, questioning, the teacher has to be prepared to question, and clarifying, and then refining so that the success criteria can be organized. And I'm going to share with you some examples here of each of these steps. Important piece is to model and practice using the success criteria because a cornerstone of this is about providing feedback. And we can't assume that everyone knows how to provide effective feedback. And then uh, success criteria can be used to set personal goals and the criteria for success throughout the unit and to modify those as one becomes more comfortable and uh, achieving the criteria and moving on to what's next. And last, how to use success criteria as evidence to produce the evidence to actually prove learning, not only to themselves, but to others, the teacher. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So I'd like to take you through an example so you can get a sense of what this might look like. And you saw this learning intention earlier in Larry's presentation. And it is a speaking and listening standard uh, for grade six. And this is the learning intention that a teacher might present to the student. And it's designed to help answer, where am I going? What will we learn? And we're only going to focus in on one standard for this unit at this time, just to make it a little simpler, because it's a pretty hefty standard. So there's the learning intention that will be shared. Is the success criteria is really pretty much spelled out, as Larry mentioned earlier, in the standard itself. And I'd like for you to just take a moment and mentally underline what you see as all the criteria that students must meet, meet that's identified in this standard to meet that learning intention. What are the skills and the concepts that they're going to demonstrate? Probably, well, they've got to present a claim and they've got to present a finding. They're going to be sequencing ideas logically, using pertinent description facts, details. Those are things that are going to become part of the success criteria that teacher, the teacher will help students discover for themselves as she co-constructs the process. These facts and details need to relate to the main idea or the theme. They've got to use the appropriate eye, eye contact, volume, and clear pronunciation. So these are a few of the things that she's going to help the students discover as she plans, or he, the co-construction process. This is one example, and we actually do use this in our workshop, in which the planning part, the teacher has decided that she's going to start off first with a question. And she's going to ask the students to just brainstorm what, from their own experiences, they've noticed makes for an effective presentation. And they're just going to jot those ideas down. And this will give her some baseline information about what students are thinking about. The next thing is that she has decided that she's going to use a, it's a 10 minute TED Talk that Adora Sitek is giving. And it is titled, What Adults Can Learn From Kids. And she's going to have the students watch the little snippets of this and basically engage them in a think-pair-share in which She'll help to solicit or elicit the success criteria from the standard. There will also probably be some other elements that will come through that aren't necessarily in the standard. And certainly we know that, that not everything will be in that one standard. And in this unit of instruction, there will probably be additional standards that uh, may be interacting with this one speaking, listening standard related to reading and writing. But right now, this is the standard in focus that's really important. In generating success criteria, this is another example. You know, many teachers already have some experience with co-constructing criteria around, you know, agreements related to classroom procedures or expectations. And this is always a good place to start if you're new to co-constructing. However, what may be missing here is what's really important is why is this important to learn the relevancy piece and also the relationship to the standard, the focus, the standard that is in focus for that unit of instruction. 
But this is always a good place to start. In generating the success criteria, I'm going to share a couple examples with you that will give you some ideas. In this case, and this is from Andrea Knight that actually contributed this to our book, um, and she crafted some writing samples for her first graders to look at with basically this is where we want to move to the three and the four type of papers. They talked about it. Then they worked in pairs to analyze the three and the four papers. And as they were talking about the elements of what makes a story interesting that you write, she was highlighting some of the success criteria. There's an example in EduGain Ministries of Ontario that you can um, look and Google for yourself, or I can help send you the link to this. And it's a video actually showing the students constructing success criteria. And they, too, have studied two uh, compositions, one of lesser quality and one of higher quality, worked in a think-pair-share, and the students are actually recording the success criteria, and the teacher is eliciting the missing parts from the standard that need to be included in the criteria. So that's the next step, generate the criteria. After this comes organizing the criteria. And in the first example, this is a T-chart, one way that you can organize the criteria. And this is from the Educains video. And it was about giving an opinion. And so the students had co-constructed the criteria for what an opinion needed to include. And that's a T-chart. You're probably familiar with rubrics, and they can be used, certainly, to organize the success criteria. But there's a caution here I'd like to give you, and that is that many um, rubrics, you know, they have four different performance levels, sometimes six. Uh, which can be challenging to use that for feedback because many times rubrics have a lot of subjective language like sometimes they do it, usually you do it, occasionally at the various performance levels. And really what students need at this point are really just two performance levels. What it means, the criteria to meet that unit, learning intention and the standard. And the next one would be what does it look like to even expel and go beyond? And students can generate that. And just having that, those two performance levels can motivate and move learning significantly. Another one for young uh, students would be combining pictorial representations like this about what good writers do and then descriptors. Something similar, and this is from the Alberta Assessment Consortium. And this is a little video of Sarah in which the writing uh, expectations are shown pictorially across. And Sarah is able to show where she's at as she is nearing the kindergarten expectation and talk about the criteria that she's meeting and what she plans to do next. And then lastly, a very common one to organize it is just a checklist. And again, we see the um, categories and then the criteria underneath. So organizing the success criteria is really important. The teacher can do this after students have brainstormed, or it can also be um, something that the teacher does or the student does. All this sets us up to be able to use effective feedback. And feedback, really Jane Pollock describes it as the hinge point between teaching and learning. Clear success criteria and learning tension, that's the hardware, that hinge that enables feedback to occur. But we cannot assume that all students know how to give feedback. So the next step in this is to model and practice using the success criteria to give feedback. Because feedback that is act received and acted upon, that's for students' benefit. Peer influences are great, can greatly uh, determine how well the feedback will be received. And peer influences has an effect size of 0.53 on learning. And interesting enough, a gentleman named uh, Graham Nuthall, The Hidden Lives of Students, in his book, he uh, studied middle school students for about two years, and he found that 80% of all the feedback that the students were receiving came from other students. But interestingly, 
80% of the feedback was inaccurate. So our success criteria is really important here. It answers that, how am I going? From the teacher to the student, from student to student, self-reflection, metacognition, using that criteria. Parent volunteers, paraprofessionals, now have clear criteria to give feedback, and even tutors, so that the feedback about how am I going turns into, hmm, what are my next steps? Where to next? It's about what is my contribution? So a student can use success criteria to say, hmm, how is this criteria contributing to my learning? What is my understanding of it? What are my next steps? Is it contributing? What else do I need? A student can say, how is using the criteria helping me contribute to my peers and helping us perform, perform even better in an orchestra? How am I even contributing to my teacher's learning? I now have concrete ways to communicate to my teacher, huh, I understand this. I think I'm, I get this success criteria, but I'm not really sure about the next one. I might need some guidance here. Give information to teachers about what learning and what teaching needs to happen next. And ultimately, if you're involved in any virtual school, you can impact others across the world. Success criteria helps us set and modify personal goals. And you're probably familiar with an example like this in which it might be a daily or a weekly reflection in which they could be referencing the success criteria, an end of the week reflection, what things are confusing, what do you need help with. And here's a really interesting one that we've seen. And that is, uh, you can see it's uh, a graphing unit. And the criteria is listed. And what we have here, the students have entered their initial when they have met the success criteria, but the other piece is they have the evidence to show that they have met that criteria. It's really enabling students to prove their learning to all these various audiences with the first one first themselves. It's using success criteria as the evidence from it to prove their own, their own learning. And you see a really interesting example here of a student in studying probability. The goal, what they know, what they've learned, proof, and even a reflection. An exit card that many of us use. What have I learned? What have I improved? Some evidence. Why descriptive evidence from success criteria? Well, think about this. Students receiving just a score, what is that telling them? What criteria have they met? Seven out of the 10, but what three still remain? Consider this response. Name six animals which live specific, specifically in the Arctic. That is a really creative response. But the feedback, the evidence, is coming back to the teacher in terms of the assessment question. And information that we receive, what's the story behind all these numbers? Success criteria is what paints the story. So it's really helping us with where to next. It's that entry point for students that co-constructed success criteria, taking that time to do that, to create a pathway that is transparent, where they can predict or plan their entry point and where they need to go next. It eliminates that pathway. And these are all the things that we work on in our uh, workshop to help teachers become really clear on that and give them time so that they can apply it to their own learning. So I know Larry and I would like to leave this idea with you as we come to a close. As you contemplate your path to ensure all students achieve 
and even exceed the intended learning count and learning intentions that you have for them. And so it's been our pleasure, and I'll take some questions now. I see, I can see on the chat some that have come up, but perhaps you could help me. Yeah, I can help you with that. I have, it's Jeff, and I have some questions. Um, I have a question from Dawn Lyons. She says, what are your suggestions for presenting this information to a faculty? Well, I, you know, I, certainly if you wanted to do this on your own, uh, but there are resources that I could recommend for you, and we will have our email addresses coming up. And I'd certainly be happy to engage in a conversation with you. Uh, feel free to contact me. But I think that it starts with my suggestion is to, as we do in our workshop, is to give them a concrete experience of co-constructing success criteria uh, for something that you are working on in your school. I'd be asking that question, what is it going to look like, sound like, feel like if we do this? And I would start with uh, something that they're familiar with in terms of uh, something in, uh, as an expectation, maybe assembly behavior. What is the criteria for success for assembly behavior? And what is our intention? Why, why do we want them to do that? What's the relevancy piece for it? Thank you. I have another question from Tara No. Mm -hmm. Is there a recommended template for lesson planning if your district wants to use a form that is universal throughout grade levels and content areas? Well, I think in the workshop that uh, Larry's talking about with the learning intentions and success criteria, there certainly is a template uh, that guides teachers through the process that would be very helpful. And as far as the template for this co-construction would be to go back and revisit those steps that I outlined, the pathway. And you will be receiving, or uh, you can receive, you will receive a link to the webinar, which will have that, but I would be most happy to provide that for you, too. Thank you. And one last question. Valerie asks, will there still be an expected daily mastery of a component of the standard during learning progressions if they span over more than one day? Well, I think that depends on the, on the standard and the learning progression. I think you heard Larry say, and I would agree, too, that this, we may work on success criteria that forms the basis for a lesson. It may be one day, it may be two days, it may be three days. But this is a way to, this, this, the example I gave for the presentation, they're going to uncover the basic elements of what makes an effective presentation. But let's take, for example, the difference between presenting a claim and presenting a finding. What is that? And so we would probably, in the teaching piece and lesson piece, that would be maybe a half a day lesson. I mean, a, a half a period lesson or a whole lesson. Because it also links to the reading and writing standards that deal with argument, claim argument, and findings filled with informational reading and writing. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, do you want to go to the next slide, and I'll turn it back over to Lisa. So there's our uh, email information. If I can just leave that for a moment. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, we'll just uh, leave it there. Thank you so much, Larry and Mary Jane, and thanks to all of our attendees for taking some time out today from your busy schedules to join us. So um, to see here is the contact information for Larry and Mary Jane, and um, we will be uh, making sure to send that out in a follow-up email, um, as well as um, information on um, the workshops that they've mentioned and um, a special uh, discount code offer to all attendees on purchasing uh, any of their books, if you would like. So um, thanks again to everybody, and um, we appreciate you attending today and hope that you will uh, continue to come to some of our forthcoming Monday afternoon webinars um, throughout the rest of the fall. Thank you. Thank you for everyone coming and, pre and uh, being part of this. I know Larry and I appreciate your time. Well, thank you, everyone. That brings us to the end of the 
Monday webinar. Thank you all for attending. It's appreciated.